you know, I kind of like being referred to as the talent. It does make you feel very good. The, <laughs> this, this extreme positivity from the production team, I really appreciate it. There's nothing that beats, I think, when you get to sit in the hair and makeup uh, chair. And obviously we don't have that for this, so those who are watching on YouTube can kind of see our raw faces as it is. But <laughs> those listening to audio only, uh, no, we don't have any hair and makeup helping us out. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, you're watching now on the Flowcast YouTube channel, so make sure you subscribe, hit the uh, the ding bell so you get alerted when new content comes out over there. Still going to have all the workplace comedy stuff, everything PBC related for those of you uh, who like that stuff here at the Flowcast Studios. We're still going to be producing this show, but we're going to be living over here. Those of you listening on audio, it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. <clears throat> Maybe some behind the scenes. It was an interesting conversation. You know, you guys approached me, you wanted to have a clearer identity on the Flowcast Studios YouTube page versus a clear identity on the identity on the Flowcast side. And this podcast, we you know, we definitely try to be entertaining, but it leans in the more yep. in the realm of educational, whereas on studios you want to have more of a comedy slant to it. And so kind of like solidifying it and really start that made a ton of sense yep. to me. So for the for the viewers and the listeners, a little behind the scenes of how you sort through content and YouTube yeah. channels and where it all goes. So that's that's the why behind us being on a new channel. Yeah. And it's all about your mood. You know, when you're listening and you're watching it's, are you looking to to laugh? If you want to laugh, you want to kind of be entertained by some relatable stuff, head on over to Flowcast Studios. You can, all on all social media platforms, and we've got plenty of that entertainment there. But if you're looking to kind of just elevate your accounting game, stay up to date, be in on the insights and thought leadership of the, ind- the profession uh, in the industry, then you know, Flowcast is where you want to go because we've got a lot of smart people at this company. We've got a lot of really intelligent clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and... A lot of great research, I think, that gets performed by, especially the marketing team, just pulling all the surveys and, and the data. And the, yeah, it's really it's really good stuff, especially with all the partners yeah. we get to work with as as well on top of it. So cool. I and, love I love the switch. Great. Yeah, call. and some of that stuff that we're going to throw right in here, and that's the stuff we're talking about on the fintech flow podcast. So cool. let's get uh, let's get flowing. All right. What's going on, everybody? This is the FinTech Flow Podcast 2024 Season 2, which is our second episode now. And uh, now we can start getting people up to date. The Super Bowl had to finish, I think, for my mind to start looking at what else is happening throughout 2024. Yeah. I mean, sorry for the delay here. We've, we've had a lot going on, though, between uh, Year End and then Flowcast Go, our awesome company conference that we had last week, so which fun. I think everyone's still still buzzing about. It was so much fun, man. It was awesome. Just like end to end, I had an incredible time. I didn't have this idea until after I got back, and I was so annoyed that I didn't think of it in time. Accountants on a day-to-day basis versus accountants in Las Vegas. Yeah. And it's... <laughs> Two different versions, same person, two different versions. And it's like the outlet. It's like that one opportunity to be like, it's almost like a break room where you just get to smash stuff and let it all out. Vegas, I think, is the chance to let that risk averse nature go. I completely agree. Like, I ran into many flowcasters and was shocked at how much money was on the table with a lot of people. <laughs> we had a, and you know, I have a good sense of how much everyone makes sure, around the company. And we had, we had someone walk up to me, or I had someone walk up to me and pull the chips out of their pocket and they showed me $6,000 worth of chips. And I'm like, whoa, all right. And then come to find out the dude was at the high roller section. He was like in there betting with like <laughs> the other conference there was this man, some manufacturing yeah. company. And he's in there gambling with the CEO of that company. So it's like CEO... And then someone else from our company hanging out with him, all betting at the same time. And so, yeah, the risk averse nature of money goes out the building when you're in Vegas. And then all of a sudden, like, dude, we were taking over craps tables. The, those minimums are no joke anymore in right. Vegas. And so, yeah, it was it was a great time. I, I totally agree with your assessment there. The thing is, in the modern world, like, you don't know what other stuff people have going on as well anyway. But whether it's side hustles, whether it's family money, whether it's real estate, whether it's, you know, whatever sources or somebody just has been saving up and you know what, if they, if you live in a pretty accountant lifestyle throughout the rest of the year, you've got this gambling pool that you sort of saved up on. And this is your one chance every other year to sort of splurge. Or if you bought Bitcoin early, it's back. Yeah. You're back. You're good to go. And so some, yeah, some of them will be in there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so getting up to date on all this sort of stuff. Speaking um, of money. Yeah. Uh, Private equity, it's making its way into the accounting realm. We kind of touched on this a little bit last year when there's, some news circulating, but this is from Accounting Today. Baker Tilly US uh, is receiving an infusion of funding from a pair of private equity firms, Hellman and Friedman and Valeas Capital Partners, making it the biggest accounting firm, which is a top 10 to date to accept PE funding. They're splitting into an advisory and tax group and then a test services group. Okay. And obviously that's the big move. All of these companies, they make that split because they want to try to maximize their advisory services and 
audit independence issues always becomes a problem as they're looking to grow. And it makes me kind of think of the inverse of the streaming and cable conversation with- What do you mean? So I, I, I'm imagining the origins of the accounting firms, right? And it was probably somebody performing some sort of public accounting duty and they started expanding upon that and growing. And so maybe you're an audit firm and you were growing your audit services, your attestation services, your reviews. You want to try to expand. How do you grow? How do you make more money? There's only a certain number of companies that you could do that for. And there's a certain cap on how much you can make an audit. So we're going to also, I'm going to partner with this guy who does taxes and we're going to double our client load. Yep. And then we're going to start offering these advisory services and accountants gained all these different specializations, different skills, and it grew and it grew and it grew. And then now we're seeing it carved back up into these specializations of like, well, I really need somebody to do this specific task. Um, Why do you think that is? Well, the, I think the the ad test to everything else is a straightforward one, right? That's just an independence issue. You, you can't yep. perform advisory services for those who you attest. And I think that's why a lot of the big accounting firms have been shedding audit clients because they realize they can make more offering advisory services to them. I think it's just the ebbs and flows of trends when it comes to all the different advisory services where you kind of want to feel like you're going to somebody who specializes. And these big companies get so clunky and it becomes so cookie cutter mm -hmm. that there is an appeal, I think, to boutique services. And so this is what we specialize in. We're not gonna get our hands in all these other areas, which we could do, but that's not really our bread and butter. And it's kind of the the, the theme of focusing in uh, on a niche. It kind of all comes back, you know, we're, we're the same reason we're splitting up. We're not gonna try to do all types of content in the same place. You're gonna pick, this is the type of content that we make here and that's what we're gonna do. And I think when it comes to service lines and industries, this is the industry we're specializing in. Yeah. You're, so it's, it's interesting because, you know, private equity is all about efficiency and driving it. And generally, you would say breaking up a company, you're losing some of the synergies that went into combining that. And is it going to be less efficient? But I think you're onto something by like specializing in what you're good at and focusing. It does make for a more compelling client pitch. You know, when you're hearing a pitch from a big four, they come in with like a big presentation about how they can do everything. But you're only looking for really one service at that point in time. So maybe, maybe that's going to work better for them and allow them to, to focus, right? The spirit of, uh, we talked a lot about focus yeah. uh, last th week. And so I think it makes it more expensive too, honestly, when it's, when you're trying to offer all of these services, cause you have so much overhead that you have to capture in. I mean, if you want to be able to just, you want to be able to just offer and pick up the couple thousand dollar job and you can't do that because it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And how many of these massive million dollar deals are available to all of these companies, right? It's kind of hoarded by the top four and then everybody else is kind of left picking at the crumbs. And yeah. so good point. Good point. segmenting is, is definitely a good idea. And I'm, I'm not familiar with these PE firms. Um, so I, I have a hard time like predicting how they'll operate, sure. but I, I think in general, you're going to, you can expect the same approach, which is cost cutting, becoming more efficient, yeah. which is not great for the associates at, at Baker Tilly. So hopefully um, hopefully things just become more efficient and there isn't like a bunch of headcount cutting out of this because man, we as we've talked about ad nauseum, mm -hmm. accounting's cut to the bone already. And yeah. you can't, you can only do so much more. I am fascinated to know what goes on in the realms as far as those discussions at these private equity companies, as far as how they're seeing this business model play out because they're in the business of trying to make money through other companies. Yep. Um, and the CEO of Baker Tilly, actually, which is Jeff Farrow, he said the, the, the dynamics of being able to do mergers and acquisition has changed. Private equity has changed that with more deals now being done with a cash component, where before you just swapped balance sheets and traded the deferred compensation plans, and it was pretty simple. Now there's a cash component as well as an equity component. An equity component is much more appealing to our younger team members and partners than the deferred compensation plans that we had in the past. Okay. <clears throat> Well, that seems like a win-win. So a lot of these firms are are saddled with big, um, we say deferred, you know, compensation plans. But yep. These are the IRAs or no, I'm pensions, sorry, the, yeah. pe the pensions that get set up as a result of this. So that's an interesting burden that all these firms are sitting on is how large is, is the pension uh, debt for a lot of them. So, okay, I hadn't really factored in how when you're yeah. buying one of these companies, you need to think about that. And then, yeah, younger people are way more interested in like equity upside. And I, which makes sense. It's also more real and more tangible and like closer to being right. achieved. It will bite people later when they don't have a pension and mm. it's not not ideal. Um, but this this makes sense. And now you can offer some equity. That's yeah. I like that. I yeah. like that. They like the they like the possibilities. But you know, it all comes down to you know how concerned are you with retirement planning? Which kind of leads me into the next topic here, yeah. which is from the Wall Street Journal. Well done. Over four million Americans will reach traditional retirement age in 2024 more than any other time in history. The decline in new population with the mass exodus in the current workforce hastened by the market where they can get a lot for their properties as they downsize and with retirement plans at an all time high, they're further encouraged to retire. So you have this 
I, it's kind of fascinating if you look at the chart. There's actually a full video on the Wall Street Journal for those who are subscribers that kind of shows in a really cool visual manner how this bubble of boomers that kind of grew up and flooded the market with cash and then is sort of exit, you know, exiting. And we're right now in like, I think next, like I said, this year is going to be like the largest class of them all basically graduates. reaching retirement. The graduates. Graduates into social security. Life graduates. <laughs> all right. Gosh, I think all the stuff around Social Security running out is just true. It's so have you, have you heard of the, the three stool concept of retirement? No. So Tell essentially uh, the three stools of retirement are your 401k plans, those sort of funding options. You have your pensions, which are you know through the company, and then you have your savings. And essentially 401k plans, and we talked about the history of 401ks on some of the vlogs last year, but the actual, some of the rationale was it wasn't designed to be a retirement plan. It was designed to be a deferred compensation plan. Mm -hmm. And so you almost have to view it as, well, this is part of my salary that I'm just putting aside and my company's gonna incentivize me to you take advantage of it by contributing a little bit to it as well. It's forced savings. That's, right. And you know, that's how it was positioned to me up front and that's why I'm so annoyed with it. Mm. That, that's why I just have a gripe around 401ks that yeah. we talked about. But I do wanna give a shout out. That was a great video. If you haven't Thanks. seen the vlog around that, that's on the Flowcast Studios yeah. uh, channel. Highly check it out. I'll leave, that, I'll, leave, I'll leave the link here in a card. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, but yeah, so, so pensions was the truth. Point and then of course there was social security, um, which is which was part of it. So social security, and then you have your your savings of four hundred one ks, which are tied to the market, and then you have your your pensions. And so pensions and the social security that was supposed to be the initial design. Those are the two strong legs, and then on your own. That's like the private and public sector right. contributing to to supporting people as they move into right. old age. And of course, as companies realize that it's a lot cheaper to do the four hundred one ks than it is to do the pensions, so pensions have made their way out. So that stool sort of that leg has gotten a little bit thinner. And now you're putting this pressure on social security. And when it comes to the 401ks and savings, you're one, you're subject to the market. Uh, and the, when you retire and when you pull the money out, it's kind of, imagine you had to take your, start taking your checks in April of 2020, that would be a little, a little annoying versus right now you're kind of at a high point, you're sitting on a big nest. Yeah. So we're, we're only touching on the social security part of it as well. Like more broadly speaking across the government, they grant amazing pension plans or mm. retirement plans, like firefighters get it, police officers, yep. everybody. And I'm not saying they don't deserve that. That's great and everything, but that's just, that's a component of future government debt that's not even contemplated as part of the social security budget running out. So <laughs> it's sort of like the graduating class, congratulations into retirement is gonna be like a double whammy for government debt being taken yep. on and us depleting uh, social security. Yeah. So not much good to yeah. be said around this. The government debt issue is one that I'm not even gonna, touch on that rabbit hole. <laughs> but as far as the social security- It's too scary to address, man. <laughs> yeah. It's like just the the thing we keep brushing under the rug. For we, are just, good. for we are just humble podcasters. That's all we got, no? Oh boy. The calculation has 2034 as the year at which the social security trust will run out of government IOUs. So the way that this happened was essentially all these boomers going in. There's a lot of money being put into social security more than how many people are taking out of social security because it was brand new. So mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of people who were, you know, taking their money back. And so the, basically the social security trust gave the money to the government in return for IOUs and the government used that money for bonds and, and spending and, and all this stuff. So it's not that it's not that they were done yet, but in 2034, they're gonna run out basically somewhere, I think it was 2010, the, the chart flipped where the number of people contribute, the amount being contributed was started to inverse from the amount being taken out Meaning the amount contributed was greater? Uh, the amount being than... taken out was greater than the amount going in. Okay, so that's when so, we started to drain it. So that's when we started to drain it, which was fine because they had some money in there already from the surplus and they had all these IOUs. Then they started tapping into the IOUs. So the government's you know giving them back all the money. It, Come 2034, all the IOUs will be gone. And from that point on, it will be just a straight depletion. There's no more subsidized from our previous surplus. And- what that means is that you're basically looking at around like a 25% is what they estimate around a 25% reduction in what these payouts would be in order to level it because you're only getting 75% in. So you have to drop how much is coming out by 25%. And around 50% of 55 to 66 year olds rely on social security as their sole income source, which goes back to my conversation about the three stools. There yeah. wasn't the savings, mm -hmm. pensions are not what they used to be. And now you're in the situation where you're relying on the social security, which is not going to be able to be relied on. It's not going to exist by the time we retire. Yeah. It's 25 years out for me. It's not going to. No, 
not going to be a thing. Yeah. Like if you're if you're in your 30s, you shouldn't be planning retirement around social no. security, right? That no. would be that's like very much a hope and a prayer. Yeah. And you're not really going to get a pension either, so it's you got to it's all on you. You got to figure out like what can you do to plan adequately. And this kind of, you know, circling it back to the accounting profession, I never really understood. I was taking all these CPE courses on like there's every other day there's one on like retirement planning and wealth management. And I was like, is there really that big of a market for this? And then I realized even with my own parents, this is like everything. Yeah. You have a lot of these people who have, it's not crazy rich, you know, status, but there's a million to $2 million of, of wealth that they need to kind of figure out how can I make this last the rest of my life? How do I maximize how much I can pass on to my kids so that I have some sort of legacy that I can leave to support them? Mm -hmm. Um, and you really got to be hopeful that your your parents set you up in a in a good position because it makes it very very difficult for you on your own when you're paying back college debt when you're paying for all your bills with the housing the cost of apartments and everything like that it's it's everything coming against you. Well, and the reality is like a lot of the wealth creation at this this generation was caused by housing prices going up so much since the '50s. Really, like you know, we're, we're I, I sent something to my family where it, <clears throat> this ad popped up of what it costs to buy a home in Los Angeles in like 1954 or something, it was like 9,000 bucks for like a starter home, right? Like, yeah. like it's absurd. And um, if you extrapolate that out to today's price, that would mean you could buy, a, I think it was a three bedroom, two bathroom for roughly $90,000 in today's wow. dollars. And I like send this to my family and all of them who have owned homes since the fifties are like, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then meanwhile, it's like everyone our age can't a home it's so it's so hard to buy a house at this point and so yeah that's i look at like okay if that wealth creation vehicles off the table there was also that incredible stock run that we've had mm -hmm. ever since the the 50s and and building up all that wealth so i don't know man it's like a yeah a daunting proposition where we're going and we we are in we are in store for the next 10 to 15 years is going to be the greatest wealth transfer in the history of humanity like yeah. through the united states and so yeah it'll be it'll be I, th I think what the future is determined by is how does this generation that acquires that wealth passed down, how do they use that? And that's really going to be, are they going to just blow it because they didn't have the work ethic? Are they going to use it wisely? How, what exactly is going to happen with that income? Because there's going to be a bunch of properties passed down that people are sitting on. Um, and I was even thinking about this with my parents as far as like their old, not old people community, but like, you know, they yeah. have a, a retirement community of these, of these 55 and olders and like are a bunch of my age people, when it's my time to inherit that, are we going to be moving and living in Port St. Lucie, Florida? Is that going to be the spot or is that just, because right now they're being built for retirement. But in 30 years, when those people who retired, you know, unfortunately pass along, our family is going to be now moving into these spots. I don't know. If your property tax basis is very low on it, that seems to be the checking mechanism is if your property tax is like effectively zero. And I know in LA, um, I don't know the nationwide rules around that, mm -hmm. but that that prop in LA like certainly keeps people from from selling their home, which artificially reduces inventory, which makes mm -hmm. it harder to to buy a home and particularly sure. a, a starter home. Um, yeah. So as as far as as it relates to like retirement, and obviously there's nothing we can do. We're we're, we're going to hope to hope that the politicians get on this now because it's going to take it takes a while to imp, to phase in. I think 1983 was the last time that any uh, law around retirement had actually take an effect, right? And all that was, was to update the age from what it was 64 and a half to 67 or whatever it okay. was, right? That was the change. And that took about 10 years to 20 years to actually phase in because of how long it takes to go through that sort of cycle of when it makes an impact. No politician's going to run on this. It's, it, there's, it's no way to they get just, elected I, the, to be like, I, hey, you know, I got to keep it real. Social security is going to run out. And yeah. so we need to increase the age limit or you need to contribute more. Or just sorry, it's not yeah. going to be a thing that exists. Like no one's going to run on that. And so it's just going to be a thing sure. we continue to ignore. Like I wasn't even born in 1983. Yeah. <laughs> that blows me away. Yeah. That was the last time something got passed around this. Wow. Okay. So what, what do you think just from your perspective, if you're, if you're looking at this from the private sector, it's like what could companies – even do because obviously it's we, we we talk about how do you get people to come into the accounting profession? Well, if you pay them more, if you give them more flexibility, give them more empowerment, that's a way to draw people in, right? And a lot of companies I think have caught on, like the smart companies, they're paying their employees very well. Yep. It's enabling you to to keep up with in, with inflation as it's happening, to deal with the cost of living, and you, you're able to live a good life. The question is though, are you able to like you can't rely on like we'll just keep giving more and then it's all on you to sort of save like is there yeah. a solution this is where i get to like there's it's very different responsibility between the private and the public sector and if we think back to i believe fdr was the mm -hmm. one who put it social security in place <clears throat> like think about the country at that point in time it was people had been working under like intense capitalist like very uh, unfriendly to labor dynamics where you had a bunch of 
elderly people who were starving in the streets and had no money because they had no opportunity to save up for retirement. There were no means for that to do that. So like at that point in time, that was a huge acute issue of, of the, of the day. Now I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm generalizing. So I recognize this isn't the case for everyone. You obviously had old rich people back then who were just fine, but like for the most part, <clears throat> people were poor and they needed something like this as a safety net. Fast forward to today, not only do you have social security, but our government has implemented a ton of policies that have allowed uh, asset classes to increase such that the vast majority of people who are now heading into social security have a lot of money and don't need it. So it's a very different financial dynamic between this population for what social security was created for versus where it is today. So that's why you look at like, you're like, wait, the richest generation is now getting more money for free. Does that really make sense? Because it was originally created for the poorest people need this money. And like, I totally, you know, my general take on government is like, government should step in to help people who can't help themselves or help nature because nature can't defend itself. That's kind of my yeah. my general take, right? Like, I agree. Like cap capitalism is one of the greatest forces that we've ever created. However, it does stomp on certain things that can't protect themselves. And that to me is labor and nature and that's where it's like incumbent on government to support those areas. But I look at this current situation, that's not what's happening. In, yeah. ge in general, I recognize there are old, poor people. Like I recognize that, but in general, we are giving the most money to the richest generation yeah. that's ever existed. I think it's fascinating. It's so true because they're the ones, yeah, like you said, everything's appreciated. And now, and now, you know, I've already, and I speak to this because these are people who are, you know, my parents' age demographic. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to start collecting social security. I was like, these are the people that already have the, this, the pension from there. They've already got the crazy big 401k. They've already got the property, which is appreciated in value. And now they're going to get the social security. And so I think actually to tie it back to accounting, um, <laughs> this is- this Let's is, bring it back. Yeah. I'm this just, is where- I think I'm the in my doomsday <laughs> rant mode. <laughs> I think this is where there's the opportunity for that wealth management aspect. And a lot of wealth managers like to partner with CPAs who have their own practices. I think yep. accountants are- very suited for just just naturally being fiscally minded in the same way that somebody who you see is super creative and they're just they have the ability to act very well there's the same sort of just natural innate ability in people who are in accountants to just have this fiduciary and fiscal understanding that's just it feels like common sense but uh, there's an opportunity I think to help the only way that the next generation is going to be able to afford retirement is they kind of have to use this this sum that's coming from this generation ahead of them, which is getting passed along. And it's, you're going to have to like figure out how do I preserve this? How do I maximize the wealth that my parents have accumulated? How do I, how do we get that passed down in an efficient and effective way? How can I use that money now to invest in myself and my future in retirement? And you have to, you're, we're almost dealing with uh, like kingdoms of the dark age, like lords of the dark age, where how do you create your own little silo of ecosystem? Yeah. And what's, what's sad is that's a, you know, rich get richer situation yeah. and not, not good for society yeah. as a, <clears throat> as a whole. So this is all a very tricky thing that we have to get sorted out. Yeah. And I don't know how, yeah. you know, I see a, I, I see, I see a, a movie happening right now of it, it takes place in 2035. Right. And we start, uh, we start figuring that out. Well, that one should be what's, what are you going to do without accountants? Cause yeah. in 10 years, I don't know how tax returns are going to get done and everything that, that would be a, yeah, 20, 2035, a world with no, with yeah. no slash minimal accountants. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. Hollywood will have some stuff for them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the final piece on this is like this, the thing is people don't realize like, it's not just, okay, well the retire, you know, I'm not going to have social security anyway. So what does it matter to me if it runs out? And it's the ripple effect, the senior induced recession, because those are the people who have this time, they would go out spending the money. And if they're like, well, I'm strapped and like, this is all I got. So I really got to buckle down. And this is a major portion of spenders that are now keeping their, you know, wallets close to their legs. Mm -hmm. um, that just has the ripple effect throughout the whole entire economy. Less, yeah. less spending. and Because the reality is consumer spending is what makes the economy yeah. go round. And when that starts to dry up, yeah. then we're, then we head for the, the bad spiral. And, so this uh, is not financial advice, but I would predict the boom of the individuals who are now going to collect it up until that 2035. They've got all the wealth. They've got the money. They'll take the kids on vacation. They'll treat the grandkids very well. And then all of a sudden 2034 comes around. These checks start dropping if some solution isn't, isn't had. And, uh, that's where you got to be ready to, to be agile. All so. right. All right. Fascinating topic. On to the Journal of Accountancy. And this is something that I believe Razak actually presented at the conference, yeah. which was uh, finance leaders just having trust issues with their data. So I just kind of thought it was interesting to, to sort of touch on because 40% of CFOs worldwide don't completely trust the accuracy of their organization's data. And it's just... 
a lot of times people argue over like how to interpret the stats, but it's another thing to be like, I don't even know if I trust the numbers that are being debated about. Yeah. It's kind of like the root cause issue. And like, why, why is this such a case? Well, we had, you know, so for us, I'll, I'll be totally open and tell the story of Flowcast. We, we had a really good handle on our data for the first few years, I would say. And then you just get to a point where you have system sprawl and data coming from all sorts of different places. And then all of a sudden, you know, finance fires up one report and that doesn't reconcile to the report that CS has and everyone has their own source of truth. So we started to see that and it's definitely like, you know, not only can we not have a debate or like we, we or not only can we not make a decision here, we can't even have a debate around what to do if these numbers aren't like you need to start, you need a point of truth to start with. And yeah. so you end up having to make more decisions kind of on, on gut and like some half piece of data. And you spend a lot of time arguing over reconciling these data sources and what makes sense and what doesn't. So it's just inefficient. It leads to poor decision-making or more of a reliance on gut to make different decisions, I would say. Um, so Razak got, got this cleaned up. That was one of his first tasks was to take all of our systems, feed them into one source of truth, one database, and then put a uh, business a business intelligence tool on top of that. So we have one source of truth to go to for all of our conversations. Um, and that's, that's what he was talking yeah. about at Flowcast Go is like really having that. And now we're at a point where it's honestly like, I almost have too much data and it's like, okay, cool. We got all this, but like, uh, now we kind of need to go use your gut a little bit to make yeah. to make calls. So it's really funny the whole the whole roundabout yeah. the whole roundabout part of it. But yeah, this is a very common problem. Um, like you'd be shocked, man, in, in going through you know maybe the series A, B, C rounds of funding for us. I I I headed into it being like, oh, you know, I'm sorry we don't have this, and and this isn't detailed or whatever. And every VC was just like, no, you're so much better than everybody really? else. Like we have so many companies we're looking at where they can't even run like an ARR per customer report. Wow. It's, it's right. Like, <laughs> wow. And I was, I was mad that our commissions was off from, you know, our commission expense by a few hundred bucks. Yeah. Not like we cannot generate a report of revenue by, by account. That seemed wild to me. So while I complain about it in the grand scheme of things, we were doing great. And then I also want to just tell everyone, if this is your situation, don't feel bad. You're not the only one and it is possible to get out of it, but it does require a little bit of focus to make it happen. And this was one of Rizok's first like key projects that he took on. Yeah, I, th I think one of the ways that it feels for a finance professional, and this is something, an analogy that I think everybody can relate to. There's a reason why we try to put all of our passwords into one of these now password lock boxes, right? Yeah. So like we have like one pass, there's last pass, and you want to get all of your information to be secure and kept there. And you only have to remember your one password and through that you can access all the other ones because the number of apps that you have to have now at this point, and everyone has their own login. Everyone has, I have, I have five different email accounts, four different social media accounts on each different platform to remember all of these passwords. And then you got your banking account, your bank accounts. And then it's, it's, it's way too much. Dude, when I fire up Okta, <laughs> how many tiles do I have in Okta now? It's like, it's just rows and rows. Yeah. Uh, you need them to talk to each other. There are at least like, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have 60 apps in my <laughs> Okta instance. I have yeah. 60 tiles in here. And so, I mean, I guess if so, so, so somebody who's looking, I think, at a startup, right? Like, I think the, the key is how well can I get my Okta tile to integrate with the other Okta tiles? Yeah. And you need to have that capability. I think that's a huge selling point. It's like, oh, well, this will integrate with all the other stuff. Yeah. If you're not aware, Okta is like a last pass for business. It's a yeah. it's a single single sign on source of truth. And yeah, as we buy more software, I just see those tiles start to build up. Holy crap. We got yeah. a lot of software we use at Flowcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why we love APIs, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> all right. Well. With that being said, let's talk about our uh, my new kind of favorite little segment here, bullish or bearish. Yeah, gonna, I love this one. We're not going to do the whole big uh, gauntlet like we start off the year with, but each time, you know, we'll maybe do uh, we'll pick one thing or two things to to sort of touch on here. So, are you bullish or bearish? Sam Altman is raising trillions of dollars to reshape the semiconductor industry. The OpenAI CEO, this is from the Wall Street Journal, is in talks with investors, including the United Arab Emirates government, to raise funds for a wildly ambitious tech initiative that would boost the world's chip building capacity. He's looking for five trillion to seven trillion dollars. Dude, this this has like Huckster written all over it to me. That is so much money. I saw this, I saw this really interesting breakdown where it was like, okay. What can you even do with seven trillion dollars? Like, mm. what can you do, and why the hell do you need seven trillion dollars? So, it was like, it was very generous. It was like, let's say it's a trillion dollars to do R and D. Okay, <laughs> let's say it's a trillion to build out the facilities and start to manufacture. 
okay, cool. Let's say it's a trillion to hire all the sales and marketing, whatever. You'll want to do that. Okay, we're up to three trillion. Let's say you want to give everything away for free for two years to compete with NVIDIA and put them in a world of hurt. Another trillion. Where we're like four. Yeah. I don't know. Let's just make some other stuff up. <laughs> Five. What are you doing with the other two trillion dollars? Like a trillion dollars is a lot of money. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I'm, that's why I'm saying like this has, and obviously if you're going to raise seven trillion dollars, the company you're raising for is valued at more than seven trillion dollars. Right. And that's why I say, does this have like it kind of feels like huckster vibes? It's like taking the open AI success, going to the company that country that has unlimited money at that point. And then is there like a secondary transaction that occurs as part of this? Yeah. Are you selling shares? I don't know. I could be, I could be totally off. Yeah. Sam Altman does appear to be a little more altruistic than this stuff, and it's it's bigger than him. So I could be totally off, but it's just such an absurd number that I don't know if it's to get people talking about it or if it's it's real, but like, yeah, it just seems like, come on. I mean, it's is... it's double the market cap of Apple. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> Just the fundraising. About. Just the fundraising portion, right? Uh, it's larger than the GDP of India, which is a seventh of the world population. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is absolutely an, an absurd amount of money. And I, I maybe it's just like a kind of like a, a little bit of a stunt here to kind of just get the eyes because the issue is actually important, which is the chip building. Yes, Because totally. that's the area that's lacking. NVIDIA is, you know, struggling to keep up with the back orders on that, uh, in that area. And so getting that manufacturing up, do you need 7 trillion to do that? I don't know what, I mean, I, I, 1 trillion. Okay. You know, and you just focus on the plant and, and just turn these things out and give them access. I think that would be a perfect start. But like you said, I don't know what you're doing with seven trillion. So yeah, I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bearish on his ability to do this. I am bullish though on the chip building uh, industry. That's a, there's probably a bit of shock and awe to the the approach here. And I, I love your assessment. That's perfect. Bearish on the ability to actually execute on this fundraising plan, but bullish on the ability to execute on yeah. more microchips, which is what we, yeah. what we need. Here's a, here's an interesting uh, little bit as well, which these people seem to always get the bullish or bearish question wrong. <laughs> Investors are convinced that interest rates are coming down later this year. The record on these things, however, isn't great. For nearly a decade after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, for example, investors repeatedly and wrongly bet that rates would return soon return to pre-crisis levels, according to an analysis by the Bespoke Investment Group. More recently, Wall Street didn't expect that the Fed would take rates to near 5.5% or that it would hold them there for so long. So now traders keep ramping up bets that the rates are going to cut in just a few months, only to see that day recede with each batch of strong economic data. Why do they keep getting it wrong? And this is a chart here for those who are, are just listening audio. Literally every single time they're like, yep, it's going to go up, it goes down. And every time they're like, it's going to go down, it goes up. The federal funds rate versus market expecta uh, for market expectations versus realized is just, they get it wrong every single time. Hmm. This is concerning. And it's, it, well, here's the thing that's interesting, right? I <laughs> hope this, this isn't true, but. This should be part of the that's concerning. Yeah, section. exactly. <laughs> uh, the economy is doing surprising, like people are still spending, even though the, the rates are up. And I don't know if people have just gotten into this, this sort of state of like, screw it. <laughs> screw it, spend it, because we got it. The new normal. The new normal. Kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they keep on, you know, they keep on making these predictions that they keep getting wrong all along the way. Well, it's very concerning. Uh, but, it, you know, interest rates, it, it's really an impact on asset classes. And so interest rates go up. Obviously, housing uh, prices are going to probably remain flat because no one's going to sell their house because the property tax bills are really good. And then it's going to have a negative impact on the stock market, um, presumably. So we'll see how this all plays out. But in terms of like consumer spend, I don't think this impacts people too much because what's because it where it hits you is on your credit card mm -hmm. bill yeah. on the back end. And it's just if you're making minimum credit card payments, it feels like it's an immaterial increase sure. and you're going to keep living your life. And like consumers are I know we talked about savings and everything, but like I think your average person isn't as good at like adjusting their lifestyle to meet the needs of, or the current like financial uh, situation. The the only area where I think it really hits the regular consumers, it's like the grocery store type stuff. It's your your day to day commodity things. And and that's just a matter of it getting through. And this is actually another area where they talk about how grocery stores have sort of like greedflation, where they took advantage of the fact that supply chain issues jacked up prices. And now, even though things have become cheaper, they're still just holding the prices yeah. and having these larger margins, yeah. which that's where I think eventually regulators come in and they say, all right, you got to be a little more fair here. Well, we've, ta we've talked about, we've actually talked about this because we talked about the concept of like the bully pulpit and how the president can can use it when, mm -hmm. there's, when there's kind of like 
you could define that as userous activity yeah. occurring out in the market. Um, but yeah, exactly what we had talked about just kind of settled in. So it was rate inflation kicks in. Everyone uses inflation or supply chain as a reason for raising their prices. You see at what point the consumer breaks. Then you jack up interest rates, make people poorer. This is the unfortunate reality of like macroeconomics and how it all works. You make people poorer, and then companies have to equalize their pricing based on what the demand is from that new group of people who are making less money now. And so that seems to be what's happening now as yeah. companies are more equalizing their price to what the what the market can handle, not like a, you know, because part of it is you just you can just do a cold blooded statistical analysis and like if if the inputs of what you produce are going up and you have to raise prices to match those inputs then your gross profit should be the same yeah should be flat but it's not it's right. up for everyone so what is it's like literally by definition they were taking advantage of that opportunity to increase prices and increase their profit it was not like a, oh my gosh we have to keep right. it here to maintain profit it's it's not it's just in the proofs in the pudding like look at the data yeah <laughs> yeah back I, to data i mean that's that's the good opportunity <laughs> uh, if i'm thinking if i'm if i'm in the white house right now and i'm thinking we're in an election year this is my chance to maybe rev rev up some of the galvanize some of the people on the ground floor and get on that pulpit and, and make that stand against big grocery. Big grocery, <laughs> big chicken, big chicken, big meat, you. the meat processors, man, they they own that. It, it's like, it's wild. It, it's happening in, in like unfortunate areas. But then, and then when that's not overall reflected aggressively within the inflation number, because that is a smaller component of your overall spend. Right. So like if rents remaining somewhat flat and that's the vast majority of your expense on a monthly basis, then overall inflation is not going to look that bad. But like at the same time, eggs have doubled, milk mm -hmm. has tripled. Like like stuff is way more expensive than it used to be. And if you're someone who's not buying a nice apartment and food is a higher percentage of your overall spend, your personal inflation is significantly larger than whatever, yeah. you know, whatever the White House are, is, is saying. And so that's why you have this big contrast of like, you'll hear the economy is going well and everything, but then you talk to the average person and they, they feel poorer. Yeah. They feel like they have less because I think that is the reality. It's yeah. yeah. The, the tough anyway, thing, the economy is different for, yeah. for everybody. It's I mean, the, the tough thing story. about it is, is like for the regular person, it is kind of like death by a thousand cuts and it's, you, you don't really feel it's the, it's the slow boiling, you know, the analogy of the frog in the boiling water where, yeah. you know, it's just, it keeps getting hotter and hotter and you don't feel it because it's only one degree hotter. It's one degree hotter. Next thing you know, you're sitting in boiling water uh, and you're like, oh shoot, I should have jumped out a little while ago. Have you been to McDonald's recently? The prices, right? It's crazy. No more dollar menu. <laughs> no more dollar menu for like a. It's like fourteen bucks to get a meal yeah. that you know that your kid would eat. It used to be like, oh, McDonald's, you can go for ten bucks, feed your family. No, yeah. not even close. It's like I saw Chili started doing some ad where it was like, have you seen fast food prices recently? Like you can eat cheaper at Chili yeah. <laughs> than you can at fast food spots, and it, McDonald's in particular just hit me. I was like, holy. Holy crap. There was nuts. one spot, I think, in Connecticut they talked about because there's a lot of autonomy that McDonald's uh, corporate gives oh, franchisees. Okay. Okay. And um, I think there was one in, in Connecticut at one point that had like a burger they were selling for like $25. It was, I was like, that's a full restaurant level burger like meal that we're talking about that's, here. That's so Connecticut. Which is insane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so why do you think the Fed just keeps, well, or not the Fed, but why do you think investors just constantly get this stuff wrong? That's a great, that's a great question. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's like a, a delayed reaction yeah. to all of this because there's generally people speculate on the minutes pretty aggressively. And then maybe the Fed has to like adjust the opposite direction as people respond really like, because, yeah. you know, Q4. Q3, Q4 was when the bull run started happening, particularly in like the SaaS market where they're more dependent on interest rates being low. So people started buying in based on like a hunch that we're going to start cutting next quarter. That right there, all the cash that's sitting on the sidelines, all of a sudden that starts going into the market, makes the market rip again. Um, so now it's like, oh, maybe should we? Should we increase rates? I don't know if that's the right call now. And so maybe, or should we cut rates? I don't know if that's the right call anymore since the market went up so much. Yeah. So maybe they make the opposite decision, right? Because, sorry to go on my soapbox again, but like interest rates, when they go low, what you're basically saying is, as, as it relates to the stock market, what you're basically saying is, okay, now it's cheap for me to take down more debt off other assets that I have and put it into the stock market where it's going to grow. So I can take out a second mortgage or I can take out a loan against this these shares that I already own and then I can put more of that in the stock market when prices are low. That's that's why interest rates move the market because, but the reality of today's market is there's so much cash just sitting on the sideline 
that people don't have to wait for the rates to actually get cut before they can execute on buying into the stock market. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that's the problem is there's a big delay in, in the discussion around that versus yeah. when people could actually execute on it. So it comes to the people who have cash on the side who drive up the market yeah. ahead of any of that happening. The other thing that I can't help but think about is if I'm if I'm on these, so investors have a soap box of themselves, you know, in publications and stuff like that. And if like, oh, the rates are going to go down. Everybody's then now pumped about like, oh, rates are going to go down, market's going to go up. So then they, they jump in, like you said, they have that casting around so they don't have to wait. They actually just jump in, yep. which then pushes it up further, which then makes them be like, well, now we're not going to drop the rates because it's you know, it's going the other direction, mm-hmm. which then basically they kind of, by, by them predicting one thing, the opposite actually happens. The other thing that I think happens too is like, it seems from just looking at this trend, their investors are always just going to guess the opposite of what's currently happening is almost kind of what it looks like. It's, it's, if interest rates are low, they're like, all right, they've been low. They're going to probably go up, right? And then if then a couple months go by and they still haven't gone up, they're like, it's going to go up. It's going to go up. And then it mm-hmm. doesn't. And so every single time, once every, you know, however often they'll hit it right because then they're like, now's the time. And then, up, oh, it was the time. And then they're like, all right, well, they came up, so now they're going to go down, right? Now yeah. they stay flat. Now, now they're going to come down. Oh. And, and you kind of just see that once every couple years, they actually get it right because they just keep saying the opposite up until the point where it goes there and then they switch it and go the other way. Yeah, at some point, at some point you're right. If it's you like playing roulette. It's like, it's like playing yeah. roulette. It's going to be black. It's, gotta, it's going to be red. It's red, red, red the last few times. It's got to be up. There it is. And then it, <laughs> and then it, and then it swaps. All right. That was the my, my Vegas analogy. It's still in me. The startup breakdown. So this is a little thing where I wanted to do some insights into major terms or concepts or trends in the startup world or someone getting started in their career, getting some inside details of some commonly discussed but rarely understood industries. Cool. Uh, everybody's always fascinated with startups. Everybody's always fascinated with uh, different career options that are into things that are kind of coming up on the way now, but very few people actually know a lot about it. So I think this is one which I'm hoping you would probably know a decent amount about. I um, hope so. I'll be really disappointed in myself if I don't. So we're talking about uh, Section 409A of the Internal Revenue Code, the ooh, safe ooh, harbor let's go. expires. And <laughs> so obviously I had some inspiration recently on this. As a non-public company, you know, you're know, you able to issue uh, options and grants and approve an options and exercise under the safe harbor. So I don't know, maybe just start off like, conceptually, what exactly is this all pertaining to? Yeah, so, okay, 409A, very touchy subject for starters. Sure. Uh, I was involved in an audit where the CFO ultimately went to prison for violating some of this stuff. So, wow. yeah, near, near and dear to my heart. And the the general uh, general thing that sends you to jail is when you backdate uh, stock options. Mm-hmm. That, that's around it. So I'll, get, I'll try to give a quick breakdown here. Um, so when you join a startup, oftentimes you're joining for the equity and the upside that you can get around that. And so what we do is we grant stock options, an option is the right to purchase shares at a certain price. That price that you can purchase the shares for is determined by the 409A valuation. So what ultimately happens is that 409A valuation is redone at some regular in- interval. The or the cadence up front, like we did a 409A once a year, annual. Then when you start growing faster, you have to do it more frequently because the value is changing and that has different tax implications and all kinds of stuff. Then the other one is if you accept a term sheet from investors, that's considered a material pricing event. And so you need to do another 409A at that point. I think one of the big questions is like, why is an option price lower than just the price per share that's been agreed upon? And that is the weird disconnect. So you have, we'll go out and raise money and let's say it's $15 per share. For the, for the fundraise. Sure. I'm just making up numbers. Let's say it's 15 bucks a share. The stock options might come in at a 409A price of $5. So for $5, I can exercise my right to buy a share that was just purchased for $15 by an investor. Mm-hmm. So there's an implied gain of $10 right, right there, right? So Drew, if I handed you a bunch of stock options for five bucks, you could exercise them for 15 and sell it to somebody because there's a somewhat liquid market, uh, you automatically get 10 bucks per share. Great, great spot to be in. And then the reason you want to join earlier in a startup's history right. is because a foreign your price is much lower. Yeah. So for example, shout out to all of our employees who joined us in 2015. A lot of them we saw at Flowcast yeah. Go, you guys got to meet last week. Their options are eight cents a piece. Amazing. Good spot to be yeah. in. <laughs> great spot to be in. You know, today it's, we've done a lot of great work as a company. And when you join a little bit later, there's less upside opportunity yep. because you've taken on less risk. And so now our strike price is significantly higher sure. than eight cents, eight cents per share. But that's why you want to get in early is yeah. to get that upside. But a lot of that comes with risk. And the risk there is you might grant a stock option. 
you'll have whatever your 409A price is. And this is why there's a delta between the value of your stock option and the, the per share price. Yeah. There's a very real possibility. We're lucky at Flowcast because we haven't had this situation and we're one of the few that have been really successful. There's a very reasonable chance that your stock options end up being worth zero because you might have a really excited investor lead around a certain price today. The money that they put into the company generally comes with what's called a preference stack. The preference stack means that they have the right to get their money back first mm. before any other shareholder would. So let me just give a quick quick yeah. example of that, if sure. that's okay. Yeah. Uh, our first round of funding, we raised six and a half, so there's our series A, we raised six and a half million bucks at an $18 million valuation way back then. Now, that means that if we were to sell the company, that fund would get their $6.5 million back first. And so if we ended up selling for 6 million bucks, all $6 million goes back to that VC fund, that measly little 500 grand that's left then gets divvied up across everyone on an as converted basis, which means every shareholder then shares equally in that $500,000. That's not much of a win. And now if you look at the valuations that companies were raising at in 2021 and the amount that they were taking down, you know, if you saw a company that <clears throat> raised 800 million bucks at an $8 billion valuation, and then the company craters afterwards, are they worth 800 million anymore? I, I don't know. Yeah. That's, it's tough for a lot of them. And so you have a lot of startups now where the equity is underwater, where the preferred share price that was done more recently is lower than the 409A price that was granted in 2021. Wow. Right. So that, that's a bad, that's a really bad disconnect. Because the, the rule of thumb is I think a 409A is anywhere from like 25 to 50% of the value of your preferred share price. So that means that if your stock price dropped by 50%, which a lot of SaaS companies' stock price dropped way more than 50% over the last two years, your options are underwater, they're worthless, <clears throat> and you're sitting there going, my strike price is 10 and the preferred share price is 7. Like, what am I even doing here? What's the, what's the, what's the point of all this? And the point is you're hoping that you can get that value back up above 10. Sure. But the reality is what a lot of companies did was they had to go back and revalue options, which is a whole pain like yeah. to go through all of that. They had to revalue options to keep employees motivated to keep them around. Um, so anyway, wow. the 49 a price is to arrive at that. And and a, re a big reason that there's that, that difference in prices, there's the preferred uh, stack that I mentioned. So And then there's a lack of marketability around it. So we're not a public market. You can't just sell it tomorrow. There's some risk around, can I find a buyer for this? When am I going to be able to do it? I will say that's that's like changing yeah. more in private companies. There's more, you know, they're investors. I know you probably get reached out to yeah. on LinkedIn and stuff. I know there are a bunch of like smaller investors trying to buy shares from employees and early investors and stuff. So there's a bit more of a liquid market, but it's not it's not as easy as like the preferred share price and then being a publicly traded company. So anyway, that's so, and what goes into the four nine A? All kinds of factors yeah. and considerations, a bunch of assumptions. There are firms that specialize in doing 409A valuations. You know, we've worked with several different firms over the way. Yeah. And there you so, go. So, so two hypotheticals. Say somebody never actually had exercised their, you know, they hadn't exercised yet their option. And then it goes, it does drop down and it could be worth nothing. It's kind of like a no harm, no foul. And it's like, wow, I just wasted a bunch of time in a thing that just didn't pan out. Yeah. Right. Now say you, you got your salary. Yeah. Yeah. You got your salary. Now hey, say you had actually exercised the option and then it goes down. You're actually sitting on, on a loss, right? You, Cause you, your cash is out. Yeah. And it's a, but it's a paper loss. You know, you're not getting any tax benefit right. from, from that. So you would have exercised, let's go back to, let's just say it was five bucks yeah. a share you've exercised it for then all of a sudden you get reached out to by an investor who's like, hey, we'd love to buy your shares if you have them, like we're offering $2.50. Then you're in a spot of, do I want to sell it for two fifty dollars or do I want to just hold my shares that I've now purchased? And so that's why there's like a game to be mm. played around when you decide to exercise options sure. or not. And I think in general, the game is the more confident you feel in the company and how they're going to do, the more likely you are to exercise your options because this is not financial or tax advice, Everyone looked this up. My understanding is that when you exercise a, a an option, you get the share. That's when the clock starts ticking on long term versus short term yes. capital gains. Correct. So, yeah, I'm just a suspended slash yes. inactive CPA <laughs> around here. I'm not giving financial advice, but that that's the benefit yeah. of, of exercising it. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's it's a, the the whole IPO world and and how those things. I mean that. Fun topic. I might keep one of the. I keep keep one sort of uh, element of that onto onto each thing because it it is a really fascinating area that 
it's just, it's, it's so in the news all the time, but it's always in the news at a high level. It's Elon Musk doing this. It's Sam Altman, you know, starting this. Yeah. But on a practical level, how does that actually play? The preferred share thing, I think, is something that's not really understood yeah. by a lot of a lot of people, and that's something that can really be played with to change the headline number of the valuation. So, for example, if we were raising a round of funding, and this dude, this happened in like the two thousands, a VC might say we want a three x liquidation preference, which means they get three times their money back first before wow. anyone else gets their money. And then there are two ways of structuring it as well. There's participating preferred and non-participating preferred. And just hang with me for a mm -hmm. second because this is a really important concept. And I never agree to participating preferred because I think it's just like messed up and not in the spirit of like venture capital. So participating preferred would be in the example that I just gave you, or the example I gave with the 6 million bucks, that would be they get the 6 million bucks and then share in the 500 grand, Ooh. right? And then get it. Participating preferred or non-participating preferred means you need to make a decision. You either take your your share of the six and a, or of the uh, six million bucks that got brought in, or you only participate and take your six million bucks off the table. So that's one where when you have like a modest exit, that's that's one where if someone has participating preferred, it can really screw people over and reduce the preference stack. Um, but if you have non-participating preferred, then the investor has to make a decision: Do I want to share in all of this? And have some of the upside, or do I just just want my money back and go on from there? So I'm really against yeah. participating preferred because to me it almost feels like a, a loan, yeah, <laughs> where you're taking no risk. You know, you're a venture capitalist taking no risk alongside the company because you're guaranteed to get your money back no matter what, and then you have the potential to 100x your money on the upside if we go ahead and execute. So to me, it doesn't feel like we have much alignment sure. on what we're doing as a company, and so I very firmly have been against participating preferred all over the years, but. Let's say I went out there and I was like, man, I really want to do a press release where we're worth $2 billion. Like I want our valuation to be $2 billion in a press release. I could say, hey, I'll give you participating preferred, a 3X liquidation preference. Can we raise $200 million? bucks?" they would say, all right, well, that just added a half a billion to the value of the company. Like, sure, let's do it at $2 billion. Yeah. And we we can finagle that stuff, but I I choose to be much cleaner with term sheets that we take on and not head in that direction. Yeah. But that's how, that's how impactful... Uh, but you could see are. you could see where the temptation is with why you see all this stuff all the time with these companies getting overinflated because rather than just being lean and and core and actually building a strong foundation it's it's the steroid method where you're not actually strong you're just kind of bloated yeah um, so that's fascinating yeah. Yep. Cool. This and is fun stuff. I, yeah, let's let's make this a more yeah. regular segment. There are a bunch of random topics, and if people have yeah. ones they want to hear about, feel free to Absolutely. comment and reach out. Love that. So this is uh, from Love Goldman this. Sachs. <laughs> this is a little uh, a, a photo which we're permitted for those of you who are just listening. This is a picture of myself on the screen. So go check it out on YouTube, youtube.com slash flowcast. Um, what does it really take to be a successful social media influencer? Now I am can, not. <laughs> can we just tell a quick story? Sure. At Flowcast Go last week, we had Oz Perlman. Is it Oz or Oz? Oz. It is Oz. Okay. Oz Perlman, who's the mentalist who does crazy. Like his set was absolutely Phenomenal. insane. But he looped me in. It was like he handed me an envelope and was like, go find the most extroverted person in your company, which was an absolute no-brainer. <laughs> I, headed, I headed over to Drew and handed Drew the envelope. And then the, the magic trick mentalist stuff commenced from there. It was unbelievable. But yeah, this uh, this picture is very symbolic of why I chose you yeah. as the most extroverted person at Flowcast. This was during our last marketing photo shoot. I was glad it, <laughs> glad, glad it made its way onto one of the slides <laughs> nice. at the webinar. I've been looking around on the website, can't find it. And they said, look, man, you're the face of Flowcast Studios. Let some other people get a share of the regular stuff. I was like, okay, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> but uh, Goldman Sachs analyzed. So this is my turn to talk about my, my startup area of expertise, yep. which is in the startup of social media stuff. Goldman Sachs analyzed the content creator industry, which is made up of over 50 million accounts, and it predicts that the creator economy could roughly double to 480 billion by 227 from 250 billion today. This is just something that over the last five years has just kind of absolutely boomed. I mean, you had the YouTube yeah. age where there was plenty, you know, circulating around, but then it was the the next iteration, really, 2019 with the TikTok and Instagram getting into monetization and all that that sort of grew it up. Where's the money coming from? It's all at this point. It's moved almost entirely to business sponsorships. Okay, and people, a lot of people talk about. You know, TikTok had their creator fund, which people could get the opportunity to jump in on as they were trying to expand their base, but also incentivize the good creators to actually make higher quality content by giving them money to do so, just to elevate the level of content on there. YouTube's still like the one that has the most monetization options, but a lot of this stuff is coming from. 
businesses. And it's interesting because I spoke to uh, Ross. So Ross is a friend of the studio, friend of the company. Uh, Ross is, is corporate bro for those who are in sales. Uh, Shout out to a great job hosting yeah. our, our award show last Phenom- week. That was very great. He did. A, he did yeah. It was very fun. Phenomenal MC. And I said, so you know, why does he do stuff like that? And it's like, well, companies have the money and have the revenue and have the, the reason for why it actually makes sense to pay somebody to do something like that. Whereas, you know, he could do stand up at a comedy club and they'll pay him 200 bucks. Yeah. And it's the it's the same set, but it's you're doing it in a corporate environment. So there is a lot more incentive to to work with companies and, and they have that balance of, do I want to go entertainment or do I want to kind of go corporate? It seems like if you're going to go more the consumer route, the subscription models, see, mm-hmm. like Substack and whatnot, yeah. is, is there money in that? Like, is it hard to make a living? It's getting more approach? difficult. And so the competition for this expanding pie, even though the pie is expanding, it's just because of sheer volume. It's not because there's, it's, it's growing. It's, it's, the competition for this pie is fierce and it's going to get even fiercer. Only about 4% of global creators pull in more than $100,000 per wow. year. Wow. So, you know, but yet 57% of Gen Z said if they had the chance to be an influencer, they would take that opportunity. So this is kind of like the new, I want to be a professional athlete. Yeah, dude. And it's like, oh, it's a nice, <laughs> nice pipe dream. We're looking at uh, schools for our daughter. We're doing these tours. Yeah. And one of them had a science class, science and math class. And we're sitting there like they're getting the pitch on science and math and everything. <clears throat> and it was a 45 minute session. 40 minutes of it was spent on podcasting and how all the kids want to be podcasters wow. in the future. So now as a guy with a podcast, I felt very weird uh, talking some trash about it, but I laughed and I was just like, that is not, this is not yeah. <clears throat> great sign. Uh, you know, I'll be, we're in LA. This was a, you know, sure. real, real snooty school. So it's, it's perhaps the worst possible example you can make, but yeah, their math and science yeah. class was all about podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> I was this, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> the thing is, is this is going to be like the next iteration because podcasts even, podcasts have already in the mature zone, totally. right? There was there was a time 10 years ago to start building up the podcast and everybody's like, ah, do I really wanna do that? I kind of the radio or serious or talk show. And then it just blew up and it boomed and everybody was podcast. And then all the content started coming up. It's always called it like the counter movement where people start making fun of the fact that like, what should we do? Let's start a podcast, which is what everybody did for about you know the whole entire pandemic essentially is like, let's yeah. start a podcast. TikTok, there was a time period um, when you were able to get in and you could post anything. It didn't even matter. And you were getting followers and subscribers and likes and comments and it's plateaued. I mean, big time creators are getting not even like 10% of their following actually viewing their stuff at this point. So it's, it's declined and the, the top percent theirs is just, they're getting more and more of that pie and they're the only ones that can actually move the needle. And all these micro influencers are kind of getting squeezed where you can get the couple thousand dollars from that brand, a couple thousand there, but that's why it only adds up over the course of a year to a hundred thousand. Your page is just filled with ads that were, you know, a thousand bucks for you to to make. You said it was 4% of the creators are at a hundred grand. Yeah. So for, for most creators, is this a side hustle then? I think a lot of the time, I mean, well, I think they're driving Uber or they're driving Lyft and they're also making content or they're, they're an actor and they're trying to make it in that. And this is the alternative to potentially, yeah, you know, instead of having to be a waiter or something like that, they're going to make content on the side. It is a good opportunity if you're looking into the entertainment industry to just build the following to increase your odds of getting seen. But again, it's just, it's so saturated now and it's not easy money. I mean, you're working there. Some of these people pull 80 to a hundred hour weeks and you need the video to hit. Otherwise it looks bad on the, the brand's going to come to you and be like, your last video only got, you know, 20,000 views. I'm not giving you money. I'd I'd love to recommend a field where you can work less and have more than a 4% 4% probability of making $100,000 a year, and that is accounting. Hey, we'll ding, ding, absolutely ding. <laughs> make it happen. Like, And there's zero risk that comes along with it. So uh, yeah, if you're grinding hard as an influencer and not making 100 grand and feel a lot of risk that comes along with it and needing other jobs, yeah. hey, have we got yeah. a profession for you? Yeah. <laughs> You're wor- all you're doing is trading an employer to work for the algo. You're yeah. playing. You're, you're just trying to appease a market, and so there is definitely something to be said that there's, there's always this dream of like, oh, I'm going to go do it on my own. I'm going to go make that happen. But is it really easier, stressful, well, or is it this glamorous life that you think it is? That's kind of well put. You have a different boss. Your boss is the algorithm. Yeah, man, remember. And you, you can't reason with the algorithm. There's no getting. There's there's no open office hours. And it changes <laughs> all the time. It's oh my just, gosh! It's a it's a schizophrenic. It's boss. your mood. It's, it's all it's all <laughs> mood based. Else. That's yeah, how totally. I kind of feel with dating. But <laughs> 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 well, what busy season really memes? Okay, let's wrap this thing up here. Um, Shout out to everyone in busy season right now. Yeah, we're, we're feeling. We're thinking about you. We're feeling for you. Our our um, excels are footing for you. 
So uh, this is from Michael Caruso, the three stages of career development. And I think I'm going to make a video uh, based off of this. Okay. Uh, so the first thing is, is I can't wait until I'm important enough to be included in these meetings. Second stage is I feel so important. I'm getting included in these meetings. And the third level is I'll do anything and anything legal and several illegal things to avoid these meetings. Can I add a fourth step? Sure. Then once you cancel them, it's like, What's going on around here? Yeah. <laughs> Have you gotten to that stage? Are <laughs> oh you my the... <laughs> gosh. The meetings thing kills me. It's like every, people are rail to rail on it. It's like, we don't need any meetings. We could do all this. And then it's like, wait, I didn't know that person was doing that. It's like, did you slack them? Yeah. No. Okay. Because you don't proactively think to simply communicate that stuff. It's like part of the reason we need to have these standing meetings. Yeah. And so people will talk trash about them all day long, but then when you don't have them, all of a sudden collaboration and communication falls by the yeah. wayside. And then it's like, well, what are we going to do? Yeah. We're going to set up a meeting. Yeah. And so... I don't know. There's no, like, there's a there's a sweet spot of meetings. Yeah. That that's the that's the reality. And my my recommendation around meetings would be to do a regular calendar audit. Like uh, my my assistant does this, Christina. She'll take a look at all my recurring meetings. She does about once a quarter, and it's really like, are these necessary? And you kind of when you pile up the hours, man, it's like not quite half my week is spent in recurring structured meetings, but it's like somewhat close. And mm -hmm. so just do like a, a tough audit um, of your, of your calendar and cut things that are, are not necessary. Yeah. Uh, on the next one, this one's a little, a little tight to read here. But sorry um, for the very practical advice in a meme section. Though. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> this is a practical, this is a practical <laughs> podcast. All of the stuff you can immediately take down and be the smartest person at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this, uh, it starts off here. There's a severe shortage of CPAs, and this is this is basically taking place at uh, at NASBA. I think was the the context of this. There's a severe shortage of CPAs, and there's a bunch of CPAs due to retire soon. How do we fix this? So your person one says, emphasize technology on exams. That's what the CPA evolution is. Let's outsource to other countries. We can get workers there. She says. How about better work life balance and pay? <laughs> Throw that guy out the window. <laughs> I think that's been us on on recent podcasts. Yeah, How about just paying us. more? That's been yeah. pretty straightforward. Yep, not not appreciated by. Yeah. The <laughs> and then this next one, I just I got I got a chuckle out of it, so I had to put it on here too. And it's just the the guy and the girl, and they're texting each other. And she says, "Baby, I can do anything for you." And he says, "Teach me deferred taxes." <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> There's so many accounting concepts that just even as a CPA, we just don't we don't understand. And it just shows you how massive and diverse the industry is. And it really requires, I think, as it relates to the whole pipeline thing, getting specific and like what actually the different areas do. And I, yeah, I, w I wish I understood deferred taxes a little bit more. Dude, you know, you know the Dunning Kruger effect? No. It's so like the, the overall idea is that when you know a little bit about something, you think you're an expert in it. And then the more you learn about something, mm -hmm. you realize you're not an expert and you yeah. don't know anything. I feel like that's so applicable to accounting like you know you listen to stuff around ai and accounting said by non accounts like well just automate accounting it's a piece of cake yeah. and then you talk to us who have passed the cpa exam and we're like deferred taxes yeah. i don't know that one's for 49a like i don't want to beat the yeah. like i don't want to be auditing that thing too much right now and so yeah accounting just is so ripe yeah. for dunning kruger effect for people yeah. who don't actually do it on a yeah. on a day to day basis it's borderline offensive but you well, I don't know if you remember studying any of it but it was always like there was the rule and then there was the exception to the rule, the rule, and then there was the exception to the exception. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like you said, the more you go down, the the deeper it sort of gets. Totally. But uh, but yeah, that kind of wraps up uh, that wraps up our episode of today. And speaking of as it relates to technology, I thought this was a little thing here from the concluding section. We got this piece from Accounting Today, which just was titled "The Future of Accounting is Tech and Human." And I'm just putting it on here as a footnote because I want to archive this episode <laughs> for the history of podcast. In a year from now, in two years from now, we talked about it last year. How long are we going to be seeing articles that are titled about accounting firms need to start figuring out how to incorporate AI? Accountants need to learn how to use, you know, uh, technology in order to do this. Talk about the uh, the cloud conversation. Mm -hmm. That fact that that's still a thing that you can see in titles of articles a decade later, where they're still talking about moving to the cloud. Two decades. Two decades. Two and a half decades later. Yeah. And it's one of those things where is you know this industry is always so slow to jump on things, but this is a thing that's going to move faster. That it, you don't have to, you're not going to have two decades this time around no. to to adopt it. And so, I just thought it was you know let's archive this. We got February of 2024 where we're seeing an article about the future of accounting being tech and human. And in a year from now, are we going to see that same headline article? I 
I wholeheartedly agree. And my general take is 2024 is going to be the year of availability. And then um, adoption is going to be the long yep. the long term play here. How long does that take? And I think the the difference is you now have the massive talent crunch. And so there's way, way more of a forcing function on the adoption of, of technology. So, but hey, I agree with the headline and I'm excited to revisit it next year. Yeah. So to everybody out there, if you want that profession that's going to over, that's going to offer you that, uh, that better than the creator economy world, I definitely would recommend accounting because there's only so many people who can make their uh, their Linktree accounts in their bio and say, hey, go follow me on Patreon or wherever else. And it's it's drying up. So Don't a lot of influencers say they're accountants anyway, so just, just yeah. actually do it. Yeah, yeah just do it. <laughs> wrap, wrap on that one. Cool. Well, great episode today, Mike. Uh, uh, great job, Drew. Great prep work here, man. I really enjoyed it. Cool. I hope everybody at home enjoyed it as well. Remember, make sure you go on to uh, Flow Academy if you want to get CPE for this. It's also on your mark. And uh, yeah, we're well, looking forward to talking to you next time. Thanks for checking out the FinTech Flow. As a reminder, this episode is available for CPE credit, and you can get that at Flow Academy or on the Earmark app. Details are in the description below.